Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Barbara Allen Diaz, and I'm the Vice President for the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources with the University of California. And I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to our Global Food Systems Forum, including all our friends that have uh, tuned in from around the globe. We're here today to explore one of the most critical and complex dilemmas the world faces, and that is how to feed 8 billion plus people and still protect our global natural resources, and how to achieve those two goals in a way that's equitable, just, and sustainable. So it's certainly appropriate that the University of California uh, lead this dialogue and for nearly 150 years, the university has been a leader in solving the world's most pressing problems. This is a fundamental to our mission as a land-grant university. And ANR's Agriculture and Natural Resources role as stewards of the California Cooperative Extension System. UC was created, UC was created for and by the people of California, but it's through our research, public service, and educational opportunities our work benefits millions of people around the globe. ANR is helping to advance agricultural productivity, water conservation, pest control, natural resource management, nutrition, climate change. These are just a few of the fields that we excel in and we've made California one of the world's most important food producers. Who better is there to take on the challenge of providing the world with safe, healthy, and affordable food? The task may seem daunting, but it's one that we as citizens of the global community cannot afford to ignore. It's exciting to see so many people from so many diverse disciplines and points of view gathered here today to participate in what I expect is going to be a very lively conversation. But we're here to do a lot more than just discuss. Our goal today is to, to turn these brilliant ideas into brilliant plans of action. We will spend the morning exploring the geopolitical, economic, technical, and ethical implications of the global food insecurity issue. And in our afternoon, we'll focus on the California perspective and what responsibilities and opportunities our state and our university faces in addressing these issues. I want to thank all of you for participating in this forum. I think that we are going to have an enormously fun and exciting day. And now I'd like to introduce our president, Mark Udoff, president of the University of California. As many of you know, Mark came to UC in 2008. <laughs> I get to look at you, you get to look at you. It's, <laughs> it's all about you, yes. <laughs> so. We are so happy that Mark has been our president this last five years. He's held many academic and administrative position, leadership positions in higher education, and he's recognized as a national proponent for accessible and affordable public education. He's a distinguished authority on constitutional law, freedom of expression, and education law. He's also a champion of equal opportunities, and he's been a very good friend to the division, Agriculture and Natural Resources. So please welcome Mark Udoff. Barbara, thank you very much. and. Uh, I'm not sure I appreciate the photography. I'd like more hair and to be a little bit thinner. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted that uh, the University of California is hosting the Global Food Systems Forum today. Uh, I'm extremely pleased that so many people from across the country 
and indeed uh, from around the world uh, could uh, participate in this great forum. And I hope that the conversation you are about to have to, to join in will echo beyond the university, beyond California, beyond America, and beyond agriculture and natural resources. To those of you uh, throughout the world who are watching on <coughs> our webcast, uh, let me say that we hope to engage you in addressing a pressing global uh, challenge of many, many dimensions. Uh, and to those of you in the room who are here for the State Conference on Agriculture and Natural Resources, we hope that you will be, leave today with a broader understanding of the importance of your work in a global context. Feeding the world and protecting the natural resources essential to productive food systems will be critical issues for the global leaders for many, many decades ahead. Their, con their concerns are everything from agronomy and geopolitics to nutrition to equity uh, to water usage and safety, bioethics, and on and on the list goes of difficult issues confronting uh, agriculture. California, and more specifically the University of California, is the right home for a conversation of this scope and depth. As the sign behind me says, California roots, global reach. Those California roots were fostered by the University of California and flourish today through the brilliant work of its agriculture and natural resources arm. Agriculture is in fact intrinsic to the very genesis of the University of California itself. When President Lincoln signed the Morrill Land Grant Act in 1862, he created an unprecedented framework for UC and scores of other American public uh, research universities. The study of agriculture was enshrined as a primary mission and remains so today. And so these new land-grant universities taught agronomy alongside Aristotle, soil science as well as Socrates, and in turn they transformed the states and the citizens that they served. On well, that note, there's no better proof of UC's public mission or of its internationally renowned reputation than ANR from Del Norte to San Diego counties, ANR is on the ground at every turn. Serving more than 130,000 California children through 4-H, expanding wildfire education, teaching Hmong farmers in the San Joaquin Valley, finding new heat tolerant varieties of lettuce and spinach, teaching California families about nutrition, and increasing the yield of California crops. ANR may be a California-based phenomenon, but it will drive much of the research for and the solutions to the global food challenge. And it will do so with the critical focus of a public mission, one that seeks to enhance and to protect the common good for all. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, President Udoff. Now it's my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, the former president of Ireland and the nation's first woman president, Mary Robinson. The daughter of two physicians. Yeah, we can clap now. <laughs> but I'd like to tell you just a little bit about her before she comes up. So uh, Mary is the daughter of two physicians and has spent most of her life as a human rights advocate battling poverty, hunger, and inequality. She brings an international perspective to these issues and has witnessed their devastating effects of global hunger firsthand. After serving as president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997, she was appointed the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. In 2002, she founded Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative, which focused on issues like health care, women's leadership, and climate change. When the work of Realizing Rights culminated at the end of 2010, she founded and serves as president of the Mary Robinson Foundation, Climate Justice. 
This, this foundation is dedicated to ensuring the needs of our planet's most vulnerable people and countries are part of the climate change solutions and discussion. It's an honor to have you, Mary, join in our conversation. And I want to thank UC Regent Richard Blum, founder of the Blum Center for Developing Economies at UC Berkeley, for helping bring you to us today. Please welcome Mary Robinson. Good morning, and thank you very much for that warm welcome. It's an honor to have been invited to address the Global Fund Systems Forum, Food Systems Forum, and I would like to pay my own tribute to the University of California for hosting this event and also for making it accessible through webcasting. It's a little bit intimidating to see this very large and very expert panel waiting to speak later, and indeed to speak to an audience that contains its own uh, large, diverse number of experts. But this forum is indeed timely, as there is a welcome refocus on food and nutrition in different regions. Five days ago, I attended the Madrid high-level consultation on hunger, food security, and nutrition in the post-2015 development framework, co-hosted by Spain and Colombia. That meeting in Madrid was the culmination of a lot of discussion on one of the 11 themes, food and nutrition security, and the kind of messages. In less than a week, I'll be in Dublin for a conference on hunger, nutrition, climate justice, about which I'll say more later. The G20 and the G8 countries are increasingly aware of the pressing issues and the potential so solutions needed for feeding the world's rapidly growing population using a healthy and ecologically sustainable food supply. So again, I warmly commend the University of California for this timely event. The list of speakers and participants is impressive. Scientists from a variety of disciplines related to food systems, business leaders, farmers engaged in food production, environmental experts, policymakers. I look forward to hearing their valuable contribution, both from the global and United States perspective. The focus of my speech will be on how we must act now to improve the food and nutrition supply of people in poor countries and communities throughout the world. In particular, I'll speak about the impact that climate change is having now on food and nutrition security. It hardly needs saying, but when it comes to food, we live in a shockingly unequal world. Almost a billion people are undernourished. In real terms, what that means is that hunger is a constant feature of those people's lives. Many will have barely one meal a day, if they're lucky. It's shameful that so many of our fellow human beings, millions of them children, will go to bed hungry today and every day. Meanwhile, Wealthy countries have so much food that ever-growing numbers of their populations are overweight. Obesity has become an epidemic in the Western world, and there's the scandal, as we know, of food waste, which needs to be addressed. Yet even in rich countries, there are hungry children and families dependent on food stamps or other social benefits for basic food and nutrition. When people think of hunger, their thoughts probably turn to dramatic examples of poverty-driven malnutrition and starvation, as are found in famine situations. The pictures of um, babies with extended bellies, the flies crawling over their eyes. But as the experts here today know only too well, bad as the extreme famine situations are, chronic hunger is a far more pervasive, insidious phenomenon. As well as the hardship and suffering a lack of food brings, Chronic hunger retards growth, lowers resistance to disease, destroys lives. Inequality is at the heart of global food systems. Population growth is increasing that inequality, increasing the gap between those who have more than sufficient to eat and those who are malnourished. Earlier this year, I visited Malawi, a very poor African country that faces many challenges. I was very affected by its population statistics because I identified with the beginning of those statistics. In the 1960s, 
the population of Malawi was the same as the population at that time of the Republic of Ireland. The Republic of Ireland has grown to about 4.7 million. The population of Malawi has risen to at least 15 million. By 2050, it is projected to reach 50 million. By the end of the century, it will reach 120 million if present trends continue. And Malawi is a small country by African standards. Today, hunger is a lot of an increasing proportion of the population of Malawi, a situation aggravated by extreme weather events, both severe drought and severe flooding in different parts of the country. Can you imagine how many will go hungry in that small country alone in the years ahead if corrective action is not taken? This is a key moment for such questions. Discussions about what will come after the Millennium Development Goals are now gathering pace in the build-up to September's review in the United Nations of the MDGs. Already it's apparent that the report card on progress towards achieving the Millennium Development Goals will reinforce the evidence that we live in an unequal world. Having the number of people living in extreme poverty and the number of people going hungry was the first of the UN's Millennium Development Goals. Progress has been made on reducing hunger and extreme poverty, but it has been unequally distributed across, across countries and regions. Of course, it is very welcome that the proportion of people living on $1.25 a day has fallen from 47% in, in 1990 to 24% in 2008, and that trend continues. Millions in India and China in particular have emerged from extreme poverty. But these figures mask a more somber story. The poor regions of Asia and South America, and above all Africa, are still lagging far behind. Globalization has brought many benefits, but it hasn't changed the fact that we live in a society where gross inequalities exist between rich and poor, between powerful and powerless. Power has moved to different actors than in the past, particularly to large international corporations who often own more natural resources than governments. The moral and ethical responsibilities of these large corporations in the unequal world we live in is an issue that I hope we will address in this forum. Inequality means the denial of a whole range of human rights, the right to food, the right to clean water, the right to health, the rights of the child. Inequality also shows itself in another respect in that the contribution of women and girls continues to be underused and undervalued. The lack of land rights and property rights more broadly together with early child marriage, reinforce this inequality. Poor countries and peoples face an even greater challenge in the fight against hunger because of the extra burden arising from climate change. There are any number of statistics which prove the extent of the food supply problem and the impact climate change is having. And there are any number of projections as to how much it will worsen if corrective action is, uh, actions aren't taken. Rather than add to the statistics, I'd like to give a few examples from my own experience of how climate change is affecting the people on the ground. In Malawi, I was struck by the huge impact which climate shocks are having on a weak economy almost entirely dependent on agriculture. The president of Malawi, Joyce Banda, is a good friend and we traveled with her to various sites in the country and it was really striking to see the impact in one part of extreme floods and in another of extreme drought. It was deeply moving to see how fragile livelihoods are turned upside down in the face of climate change. I had the same feeling when I visited the Horn of Africa 18 months ago at the request of Irish aid agencies. They were worried about um, a, a situation in Malawi, in um, Somalia, which led to the United Nations declaring famine there. There was a history to that. I had gone to Somalia in 1992 as president of Ireland to draw attention to the food crisis there because of uh, fighting warlords. But what never occurred to me in, um, in 1992 was in the front of my mind in July 2011, and that was that the Horn of Africa had had the eight hottest years in succession ever measured and had increasingly severe drought. And this is the problem that we have to bear in mind. Some of the most active delegations in the climate change negotiations are the small island states, countries such as the Seychelles, the Pacific Island states. And this should come as no surprise, since they face the stark reality that their countries will disappear under the water if corrective action is not taken on climate change. Indeed, it's already happening. My friend Ursula Rakova 
is moving 1,500 people, her population from the, a small Cataract island to uh, Bougainville in Papua New Guinea. Uh, she talks about negotiating relationships, first of all, with the population in that part of Papua New Guinea, and then getting land. And then, with great sadness, she says, but there's nothing I can do about the problem that we are leaving the land of the bones of our ancestors. And there will be a lot of people who will have to leave the land of the bones of their ancestors because of climate change. So what can be done to improve this serious situation? As we aren't succeeding despite decades of trying, we need to understand why. So we should start with a genuine exercise in listening to those we seek to help before we design a new version of the solution to their problems as we see it. For a start, we need to get real about the impact climate change is having on food supplies to developing countries. We must listen to the voices of those at the wrong end of the food supply chain, the people who don't have enough to eat because the chain hasn't reached as far as them and who are having to cope now with the added effects of climate change. A top-down approach to the problem won't be enough. Africa is littered with examples of top-down programs and projects that failed because we didn't listen to those on the ground. The people on the ground are the ones who experience poor food supply and lack of nutrition at first hand. It's to seek answers to these problems that I've become an advocate for climate justice and established the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice. Climate justice is a human rights-based approach to combating climate change. It seeks equitable outcomes to both protect the vulnerable and provide access for all to transition to low carbon development. Climate justice has a focus on people. It looks at the causes, the impacts, and the solutions to the problem from a human perspective. Climate justice is informed by science, but it communicates and identifies solutions from the perspective of human needs and goals. It seeks equity in the way we respond to climate change so that we combine efforts to avoid dangerous climate change with working to improve the lives of the poor and vulnerable who've yet to reach their development goals. My foundation is proud to be co-hosting the conference in Dublin that I mentioned, which will take place next week, together with the Irish government, which will highlight the linkage between hunger, nutrition, and climate justice. It will bring together a diverse audience of some 300 people, connecting policymakers with local people and practitioners who face the realities of rising food prices, failed crops, undernutrition, and voicelessness. The conference will place special emphasis on listening to the voices of those most affected by the impact of climate change in developing countries. More than a third of the participants will be grassroots representatives who will share their experiences with high-level political representatives, policymakers, civil society, business and advocacy groups, and research institutions. Indeed, Dick Bloom, who was mentioned and who was responsible for me coming here, will also attend that conference. I'm excited about the Dublin conference because I see it as more than producing an outcome document. The hope is that it will inspire new ways of thinking about global development challenges. In particular, it'll be a chance to hear from the experiences of local people so that we can root future thematic policy approaches in the lives of people affected by climate change and their efforts to cope. For those who cannot attend, the proceedings will be podcast and the foundation's website www.mrfcj.org will carry detailed information about the event. I must say that in many ways coming to the climate discussions from a human rights perspective, I find that they're not very encouraging. The basic principles have been agreed in the climate convention, equity and the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities recognize that developed countries are more responsible for the causes of climate change than developing countries. Their industrialization, based on the consumption of fossil fuels, put the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that are causing global warming. This means that developed countries should act first and should act urgently to reduce emissions. Yet I get no sense at political level that the need for urgent action to reduce carbon emissions is fully appreciated. At the Durban Conference of the Parties in December 2011, it was agreed that the period up to 2015 would be used to negotiate a new climate agreement for all countries. The last Conference of the Parties, December 2012 in Doha, saw some progress, particularly on the gender dimension of climate change, which I warmly welcome. But work needs to be stepped up 
if we're to get the necessary consensus on climate change action by the time of the Paris COP in 2015. The warning signs are not being heeded. The latest projections show that unless action is taken, we're heading for a three or four degrees Celsius world by the end of the century, instead of below the two degrees target governments agreed is necessary. That would be some legacy to leave our children and our grandchildren. Action has to be taken to combat climate change. What is needed above all is political leadership. I was encouraged by President Obama's words on climate change during his inaugural speech and since then. Action is what is needed now. I hope that all of you will hold the President to his promises. I said that this forum was timely because the debate about what will come after the Millennium Development Goals is intensifying. Imperfect though the MDGs may have been, they illustrated the power of setting global goals, which enjoyed universal support and a shared purpose. As we looked towards the post-2015 period, we need to redouble our efforts to achieve development which encompasses in equal measure the social, economic and environment dimensions of human well-being. We should build on the lessons learned from the MDGs, what works and what doesn't, to shape a new development agenda. Future development goals should frame development differently from the MDGs. By being inclusive of all states and all peoples within states, the post-2015 development agenda can bring citizens, business and governments together in solidarity to address a shared set of goals. Giving voice, enabling active participation and ensuring measurement and accountability are all part of making this inclusiveness a reality. These development goals will be different also because they undertake from the outset to address all three pillars of sustainable development, economic, social and environmental. Right now, we have a window of opportunity to shape a development agenda which aims to see everyone having sufficient food to meet their nutritional needs. I believe that the climate justice approach can be integral to achieving that goal. And there are some positive signs that a greater understanding of the nexus between development, food, nutrition and climate justice is being understood better. Last month, I participated in a series of meetings at the World Bank. The bank has just published, as many of you, of you will know, a report entitled Turn Down the Heat, Why a Four Degrees Warmer World Must Be Avoided, which outlines the evidence for a, the great dangers facing us if we adopt a business-as-usual approach to climate change. It shows the effect of rainfall patterns, changing sea levels, and the increased incidence of extreme weather events. It argues that climate change should be seen as an issue of social justice, and that justice and equity should be at the heart of the discussion on climate change. Another development I welcome is the increased interest being shown by the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, which I worked very closely with in the past. The appointment of an independent expert on human rights and the environment is a signal that the human rights dimension is finally being recognized. Professor John Knox has produced his first report to the Human Rights Council, in which he quotes from a study done by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in 2009 that study concluded, and I quote, climate change will pose direct and indirect th threats to many rights, including the rights to life and food as a result of malnutrition and extreme weather events, the right to water as a result of melting glaciers and reductions in snow cover, and the right to the highest attainable standard of health as a result of malnutrition, extreme weather, and an increasing incidence of malaria and other diseases that thrive in warmer weather. Let me just address a brief supportive word to the agricultural and environmental experts here today. Your work has a key role to play in meeting the challenges of securing a better food supply for the poor and vulnerable. In order to address both under and malnutrition, we need to find ways to produce more food and improve access to a range of nutritious foods. Scientific research is a key tool in human development. It's led to the technologies that change our lives for the better. Work on developing new crop varieties, improving soil fertility, and creating new irrigation technologies is critical, especially in the light of climate change. We also need to recognize the vital role of women in food production. If we don't empower women, we will not have the impact we hope to on nutrition. I'm pleased to serve on the lead group of the United Nations Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, which aims to ensure that every woman and child is adequately nourished. The Sun Movement, seeks 
best practice for scaling up specific nutrition interventions with a proven effectiveness. Engaging governments, civil society and the private sector in commitments that can be peer reviewed so that countries are reviewing each other and marking each other's progress. It is hoped to deepen the movement into a global political pressure for sustainable food and nutrition. So I'm very glad and very impressed to see a mix of skills represented here today. The forum literature indicates that you'll be discussing potential solutions for feeding the world's population using a healthy and ecologically sustainable food supply. And let me end then with a positive story from the country I started with, Malawi. On my first day there, I was taken to the ICRISAT, the Malawi Seed Industry Development Programme, which focuses on partnerships between farmers, seed traders and government to improve the availability of and access to improved varieties of legume seeds. I was also shown projects on nutritious orange-fleshed sweet potatoes. Now, the potato is a very well-known thing in Ireland. This is the first time I'd seen the orange-fleshed sweet potatoes, very nutritious. And also an agroforestry food security program. This project consisted of four interrelated components which promote smallholder livelihood security. Fertilizer tree systems for food security, fruit tree systems for improved health, nutrition and income, fodder tree systems for improved livestock, and fuel wood tree systems to provide biomass energy for cooking and to reduce the rate of deforestation. Developing countries like Malawi need their own research programs with close links to local farmers and traders. And one positive outcome of the forum might be to build even closer links between the expertise available here throughout the uh, length and breadth of California through the reach of the University of California, of, of, of California and the local knowledge and expertise that is available in countries like Malawi. I think if we're going to tackle this problem and do it with equity and with justice, we need the support and the solidarity which will really make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Robinson, for those remarks. Your remarks reinforce the importance of these kind of conversations that we're going to have today because the issues are enormously diverse, complex, and there isn't going to be any one single answer uh, for all of the issues that you've just brought forward for us. So to begin to address some of these issues, that you spoke to um, in addition to our overarching question of how do we sustainably feed 8 billion people by 2025, I'd like to introduce our panel and remind all of you that have a program, you have a small program within the larger program with detailed biographies of each one of our panelists. So we're gonna do a shortened version of those as I introduce our moderator for this panel, Michael Spector. So Michael has been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 1998. He writes often about science, technology, and global public health. And since joining the magazine, he has published articles about genetically engineered foods, the world's diminishing freshwater resources, and the use of geoengineering to mitigate climate change. His most recent book, Denialism, How Irrational Thinking Hinders Scientific Progress, Harms the Planet, and Threatens Our Lives, has received the 2009 Robert Bales Annual Prize in Critical Thinking. We are excited to have him here, and we look forward to the conversation that he will help facilitate. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Michael Spector. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I hate to be introduced that way because I, I can never live up to any of those things. Um, but I'll try. I, I first want to thank Mary Robert Robinson for doing two things. 
One, she said all the things I wanted to say much more eloquently than I could, so I can keep my remarks brief. And secondly, she's one of the few political leaders, unfortunately, that actually goes to the places where there are problems, talks about them, and talks about them in real terms. And if we had a few more of those people around, we might not even have to have these forums. But we do not, and I don't see that changing real soon, so we're grateful that we at least have her. Um, I'm going to just say a few things. And I, first, I guess what I'll do is I'll introduce our panel in the most ridiculously brief way. I'm going to give about a word for each of them. They're worth many, many more than one word. But you do what you can in this world. So on the end, we have, can I do the, do I, oh, wow, this is so high tech. So Martin Crispiels is at University of California. He's a geneticist and knows quite a bit about molecular biology and I think believes that science will play a role in feeding the future. Jonathan Schreier is a representative of the US State Department that is helping us try to figure out ways to feed the world and to do it cooperatively. Rebecca Peters is a student at Berkeley and she is a person who, unlike my generation, seems to actually care about what happens in the future. <laughs> um, Salman Katz is from UPenn, an anthropologist, and does so many interesting things involving soil, water, and why we are living the way we're living that we'll get into it. Howard Ibarra Shapiro is many things. My most favorite of them is he's uh, the chief scientist at Mars and makes that company one of the most caring about sustainability in the world, which is not that easy. Uh, Cheryl Doss teaches at Yale. She's an economist. She f has focused a lot on women's issues in agrarian reform and other things too, but I think we'll talk a lot about that today. Jim Harkness has done pretty much everything. He's been an advisor to every single <laughs> company or organization that has the word food in it. Um, so he'll talk about a lot of things, but right now he's the president of the International Association for Trade and... Institute. Close. In Institute for Agriculture and okay. Trade Policy, but you were close. I was close. Give me a break. <laughs> Anuranda Mittal is the head of the Oakland Institute and is deeply concerned about issues of equity in ownership and farming of land as well as gender equality. Ronald Herring is a professor at Cornell and has been writing about these things for a long time and has some very interesting insights into, I think, why we think the way we think about certain approaches to farming, among many other issues that we will talk about. Donald Bransford is our farmer. It's always good to have one. Um, but he's a lot more than that. Um, and he's a very sophisticated man and he can talk about the big issues, the small issues, and everything in between. And Brian Swim is a cosmologist, and we really need to have more cosmologists on these panels. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, he has a very broad view of where we fit in the universe, and we have a very solipsistic view, so it's kind of nice to have that perspective. And Garrett Spazito is a professor at Berkeley who's done many interesting things about soil, conservation, water issues, and agrarian reform. In other words, you have all the knowledge here that you need. The problem is that we never seem to put it to the right use. So I'm just going to say a few words. I'm going to, this is going to be a conversation. I have questions. Everyone else up here can have questions for each other or themselves, or God forbid, me. Um, and we'll just take it from there. We're going to try not to make presentations. We're going to just try to talk. And, you know, first I want to say it's an honor to be here. Um, and a little bit about why this meeting matters. There's a lot of room to debate these priorities and values, what matters on this planet, what we care about. We do it all the time. But there are also issues about which I don't think there is a lot of room for debate. They are facts. And one of the facts is we live in a world with about more than 6 billion residents, and in the next 30 years we're going to have to grow as much food as we have grown in all of human history to feed the people that will be on this planet. That's a lot of food. That raises some questions. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do it equitably? Because we have 
radically diminishing water resources, and the water resources we have are never seem to be in the right place. Canada and China have about the same amount of, air, of potable water. China has 43 times more people than Canada. Nobody's fault, but it does create some problems. Um, water tables are disappearing in India. Um, we have climate change issues that remarkably, whatever they do, will, and, and, and we don't really know, and they may even improve crops in certain latitudes, but there's no question that in the places that are screwed the most, they're going to get hit worse than anywhere else. And that's something we have got to deal with, and it's very hard to deal with it because it's an issue of fairness and equity, and we don't like those issues. Um, as President Robinson mentioned, about half of the world goes to bed every night either hungry, two billion folks, or fat, a billion. And by fat, I mean just excessive amounts of calories. Cheap calories, we consume the wrong kind of calories. America is an amazing country. We're amazing because we are able to produce cheap calories, and that is actually a triumph. And it's allowed a lot of other things to happen. But we are consuming calories in a way that is causing tremendous physical harm to our country, and I think to the world, because and this is a sad thing, it's not just a question of growing, it's a question of getting richer. So India and China are getting richer, and there are more and more, millions more middle class people every week, and that's a great thing. However, what they seem to do often is when they get a little richer is eat like us. And that means more meat, and more meat means more land, it means more water consumption, it means more obesity, it means more diabetes. And it's a very difficult issue the fastest growing McDonald's in the world are in those two countries, and it's not a coincidence. And it's very difficult for people in the West, i.e. us, to say, gee, you shouldn't eat all that meat. You're wasting the land. We're running out of arable land. So the question is, how are we going to farm that land? And that is a question that I think I want to just start, because it's very simple. Oh, by the way, our plan, talk for a couple hours, have lunch, and then we'll resolve all the issues facing us after lunch, and we'll tie it up in a nice, neat bow. Um, honestly, uh, we're going to just kick it around. And then I think in the afternoon, if we could maybe try to think of things that seem like plausible ways to approach these problems, that would be nice. That's my goal. Other people may have different goals. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the issue of genetically engineered food. I've written about it a lot. I've spoken about it a lot. I've been, I've been denounced a lot for my belief that we need it in the future. We need science in the future, that there are dangers to everything, and that people only talk about risks or benefits. They never talk about both. Is there anyone on this panel who thinks we shouldn't be pursuing the sort of cutting edge fruits of science, which I believe involve engineering food? I'm, I'm not against it, but it's how we're pursuing it is the key issue. In, in when we dealt with genetics, human genetics, all of the money that was spent on human, doing the human genome work, a percentage of it, uh, around 7%, was left over for each, for each dollar that was spent, seven cents was invested in the ethical, legal, and social implications of each of the discoveries as they were occurring. We, in the same situation with regard to food, we haven't invested the necessary and timely discussion of each of the developments in the, geno in the, in the GMOs, uh, and therefore the USDA never did something like the NIH did for the Human Genome Project. So if we had that as a parallel development, and if we implement it even now as a parallel development, I think a lot of the problems that people have had with regard to specific GMOs not the, and the GMO process would uh, disappear. Do you, has anyone ever seen protests against uh, genetically engineered insulin for diabetics? Because I actually have never seen that. I've never seen a European country threaten trade barriers. I've never seen Americans rise up against it. But they do seem to do that with other genetically engineered products. And I wonder if it's because 
we've promised a lot and what we've delivered are things that have been good for farmers and good for cheap calories, but haven't changed the world in any way, really. I mean, it's very difficult to go to Switzerland and say you need GE corn. It would be really nice to go to Mali and say we have cassava that's been engineered in such a way that you'll get your micronutrients. Do you think that's the problem? Or do you think that is, is our over-reliance on technology a problem? Maybe, uh, sure. No, anyone can speak. We're Democrats. Yeah, I, I think small D, small, small, small. I, mean, I, I think one of the big- I take no sides. I, I think that part of the problem is that you're framing the question in a, a way that uses the same words that created the problem. And as long as we're going to have a dialogue which uses the same terms and phrases. And in the human genome work, if you were to go to the patent and trade office, there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of patents on the human genome, on molecules, on this piece of DNA, on that piece of DNA. And we haven't had the kind of uh, rapacious response to that that we've had to the patenting of plant mechanisms in the same way. Rapacious, you mean by companies? Yes. I actually would disagree because Myriad Genetics has patented the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, which are highly reflective of whether a woman would inherit breast cancer. It's a case that's going before the Supreme Court right now. And basically, there are a lot of companies that own the genes in our body right now. But that's what I was saying, exactly. There's oh. hundreds of pages of those patents uh, that exist. And one thing we have to do is change the conversation. The, the objection to most of the criticism to how we think about genetic engineering today, and I think we could probably make a list from Pam Ronald's book of 10 or 12 words, and sure. almost no one in this room could define all those words. Maybe some of the panelists could. I was going to ask a couple of those words at some point. But, but I guess my point is that as we consider what the ability for those technologies to deliver, most of the things that Mary was talking about are not those crops. They're the food crops that are eaten in the rural sector, grown by women which produce 80% of the food in rural Africa and in Asia and in South America. Similarly, what we've done is we have forgotten about all that food, thinking that, well, they can eat soya, they can eat maize, they can eat sorghum, they can eat cassava, when in fact, the fundamental foods for the first thousand days are not those foods. So I think that there's a chance to shift the paradigm on virtually all the food crops which aren't in the top 10 and put all of that in the public domain. And I'll just make a quick pitch to the African Orphan Crops Consortium, which is doing that right now for 96 food crops in Africa, all put in the public domain, all protected from patenting. So there, That's a good there, idea. there has to be another way of thinking about this. I agree, but I, maybe on. Sure. Um, I think one of the issues is that we cannot separate politics from science and the questions of who controls the technology, who owns it, they become really relevant. Also, the questions around transparency. Uh, so this whole separation of the sciences from the larger public domain and the farming community itself, and to add to what was just said, what are the crops that are feeding people, the majority of the people in the world, uh, that the women farmers are growing in the developing world, for instance? Uh, what do livelihoods really depend on? So there's a disconnect between the two, and, and we have to look at what actually is in the market today and what uh, the promises that have been made, what has been delivered so far, as you said. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I think it's much more complicated than that. The, um, the thing is, you, you say the word GMO and it comes out Monsanto, right? Um, and the great Satan, yes. Well, it, it sends to. I, I, I think it's much more complicated. You think about uh, pro-vitamin A, um, beta-carotene enriched rice. Uh, all those property rights were settled on, on a charitable foundation. It's controlled by a humanitarian board. And there is still virulent opposition to golden rice. For, a dec for more than a decade, it couldn't For more than a decade, the, the numbers, uh, uh, Ingo Patrykas was the man of the year cover picture for Time Magazine in 2000, and said this man could save several million children a year. Uh, Ingo has on his website a little counter, every day that we don't approve golden rice, this many kids go blind from vitamin A deficiency. Um, and, and indeed, it is true, as um, 
I'm sorry, I don't know everybody's name. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking around the-, the Just yeah, say you. Yana, right, okay. Um, it, 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 it's true that the reduction in dietary richness to a few commodities makes all these things much more difficult. So rice is not particularly good uh, as a nutritional base, but if you're a poor person, it, beco it becomes the base of your calories and therefore you miss a lot of micronutrients. I mean, that, that's kind of inevitable. But the rice plant can produce provitamin A. It can produce beta carotene, but not in the endosperm. So the only way to get the endosperm to have the <coughs> provitamin A was through genetic engineering. But this is, yeah. goes back to my admittedly simplistic question, and on, I'd just like to say I'm a journalist, so that's what we do. Um, People blame Monsanto for everything. I, I do not. But this has nothing to do with companies. It has to do with sci It's not a country or a company. It's a scientific process. And it's still bitterly objected to. People talk about the horror. I don't want to get into this too much, but people are objecting to all the use of suicide seeds that Monsanto owns, except there are none. Because 11 years ago, when they tried to buy the company that had a patent and they ended up not buying the company, they said they would never use it. And no one has ever used it. Doesn't mean it couldn't be used. But that people actually use that as an excuse to blame a company for something. And the, the emotions are so high. And the rational thought seems to be so rare that I don't know if it's just a question of if we just did the science, everyone would be fine. It doesn't seem to work that way. And, and the Ingo Petroikis thing is an example. Well, can I just add on that just a, a, a bit? Um, you know, it's a funny thing about patents. Uh, of course, they're national, right? So Roundup Ready Soy was rejected as a patent in 1995 in Argentina. The seeds went viral in rural areas. They went across the border to Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil. 2002, they discovered that all of Rio Grande do Sul was running with uh, transgenic soy. Uh, and they said, oops, what are we going to do now? And the president uh, at the time, Lula, said, I can't do anything about this. What do you tell 500,000 farmers? They can't continue to grow a crop that they find useful. They were back crossing it, moving it. They called these Maradona seeds because they were fast and elusive and came from Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> the ones coming back from Brazil are called Ronaldino seeds because they, they are fast, elusive, and come from Brazil. Um, uh, you learn something every day about <laughs> soccer. <laughs> Rebecca, you're, um, what, what do you think about the use of science in agriculture, the use of big agriculture versus small, and what do you, I don't mean to make you speak for your entire generation, but I kind of do. <laughs> um, in doing my best to represent the student voice, I think that it's important to consider the perspective of the people we're trying to serve. So ultimately what I found through my field work is that a lot of people don't think that transgenic seeds have a place in local agriculture because of the way it tends to wipe out local varieties of crops that have a lot of cultural value. Um, and in the long run, it seems that these GMO seeds are really dispossessing farmers of their ability to make uh, decisions. So, yes. Okay, I have a couple questions there that others can answer. Do transgenic seeds wipe out other crops? Because as far as I'm concerned, monoculture is a difficult thing, and it creates resistance because Darwin said it would, and he's always right. Monoculture of GMOs does that? Monoculture of anything? You plant 10,000 acres of something and you're gonna develop pests who are resistant to whatever you put on it or in it. It doesn't matter, I don't think. So is there someone who thinks? I, I would say that they, they don't exclusively, you're right, that hybrid, hybrid seeds that are grown in an industrial way with, with Roundup or with other things, well, yeah, could, you could do the same, but um, in practice, the fact is that, that GMOs like Roundup Ready corn and soy have. And so but I, don't the think the question, I don't think science? the question is about are we for or against GMOs. I, I, I think that if you, wanted, uh, if you wanted plant biologists or geneticists or ecologists who could, in environmental terms and genetic terms, argue the merits of, of GMOs, 
you could have invited them. You could have, you could have found them from the University of California system. But well, I don't Pam feel like Well, Pam Ronald would have come, but she was I, busy. I don't feel like I don't feel like you you know that they're here. For for me, the bigger question is this question of is it being oversold? I mean, I mean, I think the question of who owns the technology is is relevant. I think the other one is 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 it being oversold? Because um, uh, you know, if there are a limited number of resources we have to try to feed hungry people, um, I, I think that just as in the case of climate, the problem is one of social justice more than it is of do we have the right technologies for sequestering carbon. In the case of feeding the planet as well, ha growing enough fruit food has, you know, isn't the only and I don't think even the most important challenge we have. I agree with that, and I'll move on. I'll agree to move on momentarily. Um, go ahead. Yes, I think it is the wrong question. That is, if this morning's uh, discussion is supposed to be about feeding the world, that is, the global issues, I think biotechnology or GMOs are going to make a minuscule, con or can make a minuscule contribution to this. So. Uh, I, I think we shouldn't spend all that much time on it. This is not the real issue. The real issue is uh, things, that, and, and I, I know more about GMOs than about the other issues, unfor I mean, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but, because I'm a plant molecular biologist, all right, and I've made some GMOs, uh, the real issues are that there are no jobs and there is poverty that women have not enough education, that there is no infrastructure, that uh, uh, th those are, that the, the, f the farming systems need to be improved. And all of that needs to come from the bottom up. As, You're talking about the developing world. As, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, that's, isn't that what this uh, morning is about, about the global issues rather I'm than? <laughs> Rather Just, than the California issue? I wasn't told that. All right, so. Uh, uh oh. Um, so, my view is that GMOs can make a minuscule contribution to that. I, I agree. I actually, right. the only thing, the last thing I'll say about that is the fight is not minuscule, and it preoccupies people's attention and time, and smart, energetic researchers and agronomists and agriculture experts spend a lot more time fighting over this than they should when they should be focusing on getting food to people. And, and I agree. And I like to talk about gender issues because it's, those are way more important than this. Well, one of the issues I think we are addressing here is about putting all your eggs in one basket. If we look at the resources that are being put to deal with the issues that have been just talked about, we are trying to look for the silver bullet solution. Let's take the case of the golden rice, vitamin A rice. People who have vitamin A deficiency also have other deficiencies. It's linked to undernutrition. So instead of focusing on the problems of poverty that are preventing people in the developing countries, these children, to have adequate diets, we want to find a quick fix solution. One of the big opposition and the reasons it has not been in the market was that you had to, you know, a grown-up, an adult, would have to consume nearly eight to nine pounds of rice to catch up to the deficiency. Years ago, that was so, 20 years so, ago. so the fact is, you said 20 years it hasn't moved because it took a long time to move. But the, we could be focusing on how to address issues of poverty. It is the same ag fundamentals that we have started this morning with. How will we feed you know, 8 billion people by 2025? These same fundamentals are being used right now by private equity funds, by the other resource grabbers that Africa can feed herself and the rest of the world. So the kind of land grabs, for instance, the kind of resource grabs. Could you be specific grabs, when you're talking about equity funds and land grabbers? Uh, Where, who, what? Well, let's talk about, I can give you an example of, say, emergent asset management based in UK, who is investing in so-called agriculture in African countries, who will say that we need to invest to feed poor people of Africa. Then you see the video at an investment conference, who will say, we can be moronic and not grow food, and we will still make money. So I'm talking about these ag fundamentals, who will feed China, who will feed India. They're driving a resource grab of land, water, that we need to grow food, which is actually contributing further to food insecurity. I agree. How would we deal with the water issue? 
Um, we don't, I mean, on, on the one hand, the amount of water that is on Earth continues to be on Earth and is the same amount since the age of the dinosaurs, just circulates. But it doesn't necessarily go to the right place at the right time and it's not used the right way. Um, how do we deal with that in places where it's desperately needed? Yeah, I, anybody? I, I want to say one thing about, I, I want to add politics to this because it's, it's what I teach. Uh, you think there's it's, politics? It's a, it's a terrible confession to make. But um, <laughs> when, people, when people are opposed to quick fix solutions, I often think, you know, as opposed to something as easy to fix as um, assault rifles in our schools, I mean, it's any big problem is enormously difficult to fix politically. And vitamin A deficiency is a narrow little, little piece of a much bigger problem on water. I, th what I, th I hate to disagree with a molecular biologist, but, uh, but I think with, I'll pay you to disagree no, no. With, with climate change, I think with climate change, we are going to need a, a really radically altered um, set of adaptable plants, adapted to new niches and, and quick breeding to come to, to conclusions, because these, these plants are not going to have the same environment that they've involved in. And I think that means we cannot write off any of the, the tools in the toolbox as the standard kind of thing. And the opposition to genetic engineering just says, let's, let's not walk on two legs, let's walk on one. We'll cut off the leg that has to do with genetic engineering and try to deal with other approaches to the issue. And, and water politics, I think one thing about water politics that, that is in that frame, we're going to need to deal with water crises much more fundamentally than simply uh, at the aggregate level of water supply, better irrigation, we need better plants. But it, in, in South India, and in fact all over India, part of the problem is that populist politicians are giving farmers what they want. They want cheap credit to dig deep wells. There's a hydrological crisis of the commons. The, the tragedy of the commons is that the water table is shrinking very fast because people have cheap credit to get tube wells. This means that rich farmers can put down tube wells and suck dry the hydrological undercarriage, leaving poor farmers unable to get access to the water they've had for generations. Why don't we just um, ration water? Wouldn't that's, that be That's politically thing? impossible. All right, well, I'll no. go further. Okay. Almost everything we talk about to address climate change has been shown not to be possible because we even have a president who was elected and re-elected yeah. who says all the right things about climate change and nothing and I do think it's fair to say nothing has happened that has moved the dial, at least in this country and to some degree in the West. I, I don't know that that's an excuse for not trying, but it's clear that it's true. I mean, that we could just go home and say climate change is going to happen. We're not going to address it properly. Let's have lunch. But I'd first like to try, and then we can have lunch. Um, and I think water is something that we can address. We, we certainly don't capture water. We watch it fall. We watch it run down the drains, go down the roads, go down sewers, go out to the ocean again. We, we make almost no attempt to capture water. If we started to capture water uh, in the places that need it the most, and then you had irrigation systems that were uh, low input irrigation systems, and you had plants that were drought adaptability uh, built into them, whether it's through traditional breeding or through turning off senescence when you need to turn it off to have a plant take a break and basically go to a starvation diet of water and then be rewatered and you still get 80% of the yield, you might have something going on. But till you start to collect water, uh, it, it just, nothing's going to change. I mean, yeah. they proved it during the Dust Bowl that you could collect water and you could reforest parts of the United States. So we yeah. have all these Gary, examples. You have, he's going to jump in. I, I wanted to jump in about water. Uh, I, what you're speaking about, most of you here, all of you so far, <clears throat> is what we in the business call blue water. You're speaking about the water that people drink and the water that flows in rivers and the water that is pumped from a groundwater aquifer stored in lakes. But uh, that's a relatively minor part of the water cycle. Uh, it's just that it, it's got a lot of attention, just like the GMO issue. Uh, if you take a look at, for example, the water cycle, as I do, the amount of water which 
goes into the roots of plants and goes into the atmosphere every year, about 40,000 cubic kilometers, is the same as all the water flowing from all the rivers of the world into the ocean. That water is coming from the soil, and it's called green water. That water is the water that plants actually use to create biomass. Now, that water is not subject to the politics you're talking about. Of course, you can say if you irrigate, but irrigation, if you look into it, you'll find out accounts for a very small part of the total world agriculture. Most of the agriculture in the world is rain-fed using what we call green water. That's the water in soil that goes up through the roots of plants and has transpired. We pay an awful lot of attention managing and dealing with infrastructure for blue water, and we fight over it and we share it with the creatures of the world uh, for whom we have not given a great deal of thought, frankly. Uh, that could, that's a whole dimension to talk about. But very little effort has been spent on the management of, and resources, relatively speaking, on the management of green water, and yet the flows are this. In fact, the total flow of green, of green water, because some simply leaves the soil and doesn't go through a plant, <coughs> is about 50 percent larger than the total flow of blue water, <clears throat> excuse me, and only about one-third of all the blue water in the world is actually accessible. <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, allergies. When I get out in this part of the country, I always get Me allergies. too. I have drugs. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I don't over do the drugs. counter. I don't over the do counter. drugs. It's the I, American pharmaceutical I, system. I would, uh, I would rather enjoy my allergy. Okay. And at any rate, um, I really have to disagree with you there, but everyone's <laughs> entitled. Okay, I've been told to walk around a little because um, these guys will have stiff necks if they just look that way. So I'll, I'll just act like a caged animal and walk up and back. Um, can, uh, the water thing's still, you're right, but I've been to India a bunch. There are some really good efforts to harvest water, to use it rationally. It is still true, and I forget the number, but after World War II, there were about a million wells in India. Now there are 70 million. I mean, it's some ridiculous, and that's because everyone can buy a pump. And your neighbor puts in a deeper well than you do, they get the water, then you put in a deeper well than them, and pretty soon arsenic comes up and the game is over. Um, how does that stop? Because you guys are talking about rational scientific things, and I actually, and I hate to use this word, but I think there might have to be a political solution to things like that. How do we do that? Um, if I may, um, I think it's important to connect clean water availability and the idea of the human right to safe water uh, as we're talking about agriculture and nutrition because all nutrition interventions will be laid to waste if waterborne diarrhea is a leading cause of malnutrition in children under the age of five. So I think it's crucial that we not only talk about water for agriculture, for irrigation, but also the human right to safe drinking water because it's impossible to maintain nutrients in your body if you have consistent waterborne illness. I agree. I'm not so much talking about just agriculture as having water available um, in, think, in any type. Think about another, uh, to echo your comments, think about, and, and Mary Robinson's wonderful uh, introductory uh, uh, speech to us today. Think about the issue of prioritizing the human right to food and the human right to water. And, and if you put that as the number one priority, how all these other things would disappear as we begin to enact that. Is uh, there a human right to water somewhere? Yes. There that is in 1948. Of course, the United Nations has that in, built in as I, well. I understand. But the question there. is, how are we enforcing it? How are we actually turning it into to, to a priority where, it's, where it's, it's a fundamental moral issue for all of us to uh, assure that that's occurring? If we did it that way, a lot of these other problems would quickly disappear because we would put it as a number one priority. Okay, but I have a house in upstate New York and I have a big garden and I can water it 24 hours a day if I want because it's my right. And no one's gonna stop me and there are no penalties and I have a big well. And, and I don't do that, but, <laughs> but I could and many people do and the amount of water that we use in this, it's not just in the West. Rich people in India use a lot of water. Um, Again, I don't know how that changes unless someone controls it. 
yeah, we have a human right to water and we have a human right to food and to dignity and a lot of other things. So what? I think um, unless someone controls it, and, and the key question is who, right? That's so a fairly important question. I think question. that rather, I mean, and typically the solution would be, well, either the state needs to control it or we need to privatize it so that it'll have a price and therefore right. be efficiently allocated. So Monsanto can control and I th it. Well, or, um, you know, uh, What's the, uh, what's the, you know, any of the French big water oh, firms? Right, 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 because right. there's as much water grabbing as there is going on as there is land grabbing. Um, and, and the fact is that there are other um, methods of managing and, and managing water as a commons that communities use, user groups use, where, you know, your ability to use the resource um, doesn't stem from a, an individual property right but you're a member of a community that has uh, common ownership or management of that resource and you're able to use it to the extent that you're not damaging you know, the larger resource. And, and I think figuring out how to ways, to ways to scale those types of regimes uh, or, or segment them um, is really what the challenge I is. I want to ask Jonathan because he actually yeah. kind of does this for a living. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let me jump in. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I mean, we've seen played out in the U.S., uh, in, in the Western United States, especially uh, uh, conflicts over uh, competing, uh, use of, uh, competing users of water, ranchers and farmers, and we see that played out in the developing world as well. Um, and so there is a need to address these kinds of social uh, issues and, and uh, um, create, help communities create structures for, for mediating these, these, uh, these, these uh, uh, th this competition for the use of the resources. Um, there is also the need for helping uh, farmers adopt ways that are sustainable for increasing their production while also using the, the natural resources sustainably. We, uh, in, in, in the U.S. government, we call this sustainable intensification. There are other terms for it as well. We, we train farmers in conservation agriculture techniques which involves uh, um, often no-till or low-tillage solutions because if you don't turn over the soil, you don't release as much of the water into the atmosphere. Um, and it also involves science and, and uh, development of improved crop varieties that can better uh, adapt to the, the changing climate conditions. And so um, uh, just uh, for, for local purposes, since we're here at a conference sponsored by the University of California, um, one of the um, university partnerships that the um, U.S. government has in this development agric uh, agricultural development space is uh, based at UC Davis. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a, an innovation lab that, among other things, has uh, recently launched a collaborative effort to develop heat-tolerant, uh, drought-tolerant wheat. Right. And that's being done in collaboration with CIMIT, the international... Uh, um, institution, a research institution that focuses on, on um, uh, maize and wheat, um, and uh, uh, also uh, Arcadia Biosciences. And so the, the, the plan is to develop uh, a, um, a, a improved wheat varieties that, um, where CIMIT, the international research uh, um, institution, would have um, non-exclusive rights uh, to market it in, or to provide it into the developing world. So this gets at this uh, equity question of mm -hmm. who gets access to it. So it's treated, the property rights are treated differently for use in the developing world. And Arcadia, the private firm, gets to market it in developed countries where those challenges can be mediated by the marketplace. Um, yes. Uh, just, you know, I've been listening to this. Uh, I'm a farmer. I, I just need, gonna ask you. I need uh, resources and, uh, and seed. And my world uh, is Chris Greer, Jim, Luis, Cass over there. You know, um, they, you know we, have, we have resources. We have, you know, and we have varietal development. And, and, and then we have, we have water resource exports, experts. You know, to me, how do we transfer that and not necessarily transfer, but utilize those resources in the in the countries that need it. I mean, you know, California is the most highly regulated agricultural uh, industry probably in the world, um, and we are measuring water. We're having to create um, nitrogen banks or budgets. 
We're uh, now in the process of having to measure water. Uh, there's very sophisticated work done now on, on drip irrigation, uh, which a lot of countries can't have, but, but there, there are technologies that will transfer. And, and to but me- But isn't this a result of um, we legislation? We could transfer half the people here to work with, you know, I, I mean, the, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel to farm. It's how do we transfer that expertise from here to those countries that need that assistance. Right. And, and you know, there are uh, four, over 400 crops grown in this state, and there are a lot of small cooperative extension people that are working from, with people around, from around the world that are actually growing crops here. Now, that doesn't necessarily extend to, the, to, the, to an African climate, but it certainly would give someone a start uh, in, in helping. But, uh, you know, they're, they're just, and California's not the only state, but that's my world, and uh, I'm very proud of, of what, what we have here, and, and it's, how do we transfer that? Well, um, I mean, and just, obviously, and, some and, of it and is I want to speak one more. I, you, we, I know you can we can't have speak another long, 17 but, seconds. <laughs> and as far as as far as the GMO type seed, you know, that's a tool. That's one of the tools I use. And I, I have friends that will grow GMO. Not in California. We don't grow it because of political reasons. But um, in in the South, they will grow a GMO crop to get rid of red rice, and then they'll go back to their conventional because it's a better quality rice. And so they're using that as a cultural management tool. So- um, You've exceeded your 17 seconds. I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> just, oh. it, can I, can I, I just- I don't want to go, into the, go back into the GMO thing. It is a tool, and when you say, gee, we can't use it here for political reasons, it makes me want to scream. But I would rather, because tools shouldn't be used for political reasons in that way, however, Mike. Cheryl, I, would, I was wondering if maybe you would chip in on what all this means for women in, a, in developing countries. Okay. And I can be more specific if you want. <laughs> well, I think the, the piece that we haven't really, we've been kind of edging around but haven't really talked about is what is our vision for what the world and the agricultural world would have to look like in order for us to be able to feed that many people? Um, and maybe, maybe in some places it would include GMOs and maybe not. We could talk about that. I, I agree that it's probably a relatively small piece of it. When I think about what the world would have to look like, it's going to be a real mix of different types of agriculture. There's going to be some large scale, sort of very modern agriculture going on. There's also going to be, if we're actually interested in feeding people in Africa, a lot of that's going to continue to be done by smallholder agriculture, much of which is done by women. Um, and so we would have to really look at how do we make sure that smallholder agriculture really can thrive. And I have been on many farms in Africa that looked, you know, you just think there's no way that this particular farm could feed a large family. And then you go and you see farms where you say, oh, this is it. This is how you do it. There are places where it really is succeeding, where there are a variety of crops being grown, where there's combinations of crops and livestock. And, and what's the, the difference with the way people are? I mean, are they treated different? Are women treated different in those places? Or you know, why is one farm successful and one is something you worry about? I think a huge range of things. Um, one of the issues is one of the issues is land tenure, right? Do you have do you have access and control, not necessarily titles, but do you have secure tenure to the land? So are you willing? Are you able to invest in it? Do you have enough resources that you're not trying to just pull everything out of the land to feed your family this week? Um, and can you actually have what you need to invest in it? Um, so, so a range of reasons why that, why that would be. Ensuring that women smallholders have secure tenure to land, um, ensuring that they have access to the kinds of inputs that they need, access to credit, access to education is going to make a difference. Um, um, do we have to do this in an international way for it to succeed? I mean, we're talking about a problem that is a global problem like climate change, but it is also an individual problem in individual countries and in individual communities. Will we be able to feed the world in 20, 30 years if we don't do this in a sort of 
broad international approach? Yeah. Strange as it may seem, I'd <clears throat> like to try to respond to that. Uh, what we've been hearing, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, Strange. It's, uh, it's actually coming out in, in what we just heard, in fact, it's coming out. I think one, one issue here is to say that, I want to say two things really, but what, the first thing is that uh, to say how can we feed the world is not quite the right way to say it. It's this way. How can we feed this country? How can we feed this country? How can we feed that country? Each country, take country by country by country, each country has different allocations of land resources, soil resources, water resources, political and so forth. You've got to go country by country and then you can build it up. Software allows you to do that, global models and so forth. But you don't start up here with a 50,000 foot view. You start down here, science-based, local level. And what you've seen in Africa shows that very, very clearly. It's, not, it's even on the pixel level of saying this farm, that farm. And that's right. And when farmers see what works, they tell each other. And pretty soon it's spreading. You don't have to worry about it. So that's a partial comment on this first part. But it's country by country, region by region, if you like, pixel by pixel. The second thing is there is actually low-hanging fruit. If you take a look at the yields of, say, maize, something like that in sub-Saharan Africa, they're really low. They're really low. That's why people are hungry. Okay. How can you get them up to maybe twice what they are? So at least people can start thinking about raising food on less land so they can raise food that they can sell, like we do in California, have a surplus and so forth. And the answer is it goes back to the green water, which isn't controlled by politics. It comes from the rain. Okay, now if you look at the situation, what you see is that only about <clears throat> half or less of the water, often it's very small, is actually going through the crop. It's, most of it is, is being lost to evaporation in the sky, which does no good for growing the crops. So the low-hanging fruit is, how do you move that water from going into the sky through the soil to going through the crop you're raising so it creates a biomass? Well, people know how to do that with relatively low inputs. There also is some basic science and so forth one could talk about, and it would include GMO, as a matter of fact, but that's another issue. The, the, the point is that this can be done, it is being done in Africa, and where people have learned to do what's called the vapor shift. It means you move the water, the green water. And remember, there, is <clears throat> there are 60,000 cubic kilometers of green water flowing every year and only 12,000 cubic kilometers of blue water flowing that we can actually do anything with and fight over and drink and all the rest of it. So remember, there's an awful lot of that water. Um, if, if you make that shift and you, and you move it, you can, you can in fact it easily double, easily meaning hard work in two or three years, double the, the crop yield. Uh, anywhere you want to try to do it with g decent management. Okay, I am sure that's true, but it requires political cooperation. It requires something else. You said the words get food to the market. They have to go on roads. They have to have refrigeration. They have to be taken in a timely manner. And in lots of places, that's an impossibility right now. So how much do we worry about the infrastructure in these countries? I would say in lots of places that is a possibility right now. No, of course it is, but you know, we yeah. can talk about all the great things, but there are some problems. And one of the problems is that there are many places in the world where infrastructure does not contribute to people eating properly. I, I would like to point out that here we are in this room with, with one of the greatest universities in the world uh, and the greatest agricultural systems in the world, talking about the transfer of knowledge when in fact <clears throat> in, in many universities across the United States now, uh, there is this call for taking these ideas of food systems and educating the public in a variety of ways, in a variety of contexts, not just our public, but the public of other countries because there are increasing numbers of students from all over the world coming into these universities like this one and, and the university I come from, and they want to be educated. There's a real demand for this, and that's a demand that we can fulfill and will begin to help solve some of this transfer of knowledge that's been discussing, we've been discussing back and forth. So there's a, there's a concrete thing that's already existing, we're already known for it, we need to promote it better. Um, um, yeah, Rebecca, to, wait, let's. Oh, to, to return to the question of local versus international solutions. Wait, before you do that, I just want to ask, do you and your friends plan to get into a food core and go to poor places when you're out of school? Um, some of us. 
Yes. Because um, that would be a logical <laughs> thing to do if you cared about these things, right. like I a mean, Peace Corps. Sort of. We're recruiting. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think a lot of students in my generation are starting to look at uh, policy solutions at the international level because it seems that that will be most effective. And uh, to quote my favorite show, The West Wing, I think that the code of faithful service is the unwritten commandment that says that we shall give our children better than ourselves. And uh, to return Can't to quote the, Christian, the West Wing. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were doing fine till then. <laughs> <laughs> but to return to the question of local versus international policy, solution, uh, policy solutions, while well, I do agree with Garrison that it's a, a very important to consider local solutions, there's definitely a role for international institutions because when we're thinking about water and agriculture especially, there's over 300 international transboundary water bodies, aquifers, river basins, and rivers, and 70% of global fresh water goes to agriculture. So at a certain level, it is going to be crucial to have international agreements that dictate who gets to use what water. On this, on this question of international solutions, and you mentioned infrastructure, that's not the first one I would think of because most international support for infrastructure tends to be for things like railroads and superhighways, and that's not the kind of infrastructure that helps no, feed true. hungry people, right? That's it's small true. local feeder roads, things like that. Yeah. So that speaks, I think, to Garrison's point about bottom-up farmer and community-controlled uh, types of processes. At the international level, I think the first thing is to stop doing some of the bad things, right? We've spent a, <laughs> we spent, well, I mean, we've spent a, we've spent a long time um, setting up systems that, um, you know, basically turn resources like land and food and water into commodities in a kind of a, you know, in a kind when of a speculative me, game. I would say um, the United States, the Bretton Woods institutions, mm -hmm. WTO, myriad free trade agree bilateral free trade agreements, currently ones that are being negotiated now, especially in agreements that have empowered investors and have deregulated um, financial markets in ways that make the, all of the infrastructure extractive mm -hmm. rather than something that can help communities add value where they are and manage their resources responsibly. So I think, you know, uh, much stronger regulation on, uh, on Wall Street. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, things like a financial transaction tax. There's a whole set of things that could be done and need to be done internationally before we get to the sort of technology side of, well, what sort of agricultural things should we do at local levels in different places? But see, this is where you're starting to lose me because we had a financial crisis in this country that involved banks, and no regulation came out of that. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to see how we're going to regulate these things properly when we don't even regulate the things that are quite evidently causing terrible harm to us. You know, I, I want to respond to that, um, the comments. Uh, you know, I, I've struggled from the day I began farming with what is a corporate farm versus what is a family farm and what have you. And, and some families have big farming operations and if you're in the Midwest and you have 12,000 acres of corn, that's not considered probably a big farming operation. But I think the important thing to keep in mind is regardless of the size of these operations, there is technology and expertise that can be learned, that can be transferred. You know, these, these bigger problems, you gotta let government sort out. We have people starving, so how do we transfer that expertise? And these people in the room are on all size farms. And so um, it's, it's figuring out a way to transfer it. And, and one of the things I was thinking about uh, when, when Garrison made the comment, you know, farmers are a funny, funny group uh, it could be December, and if I move a tractor down the road, people are watching like, what are you doing and where are you going? I mean, you know, I may just maybe moving into a shop, but same thing at harvest time. If I move a combine down the road and it's July, but harvest is September, people start getting very nervous. If we could figure out ways to strategically set up small farms that got visibility, you know, other people are gonna take note of that, assuming that they have the availability of the resources uh, to, to, to make them successful. So, John, uh, <laughs> farmers are smart, and that's, that's one of the things we've learned in uh, the field of agricultural development, and they will adopt solutions that work for their, their community and, and their personal livelihood, their family livelihood. 
Um, so uh, we've worked, for example, uh, to, to promote agroforestry techniques so that farmers in forested areas can grow crops that can make money instead of turning to cutting down the trees to sell the trees. Right. Some of those projects were, were uh, done um, in collaboration with Jim Harkness's old employer, WWF, mm -hmm. um, not the World Wrestling Federation, the other one. <laughs> um, they were involved And, and uh, yeah. in terms of infrastructure, it does matter. Um, uh, if farmers are going to be able to access more than their village, yeah. if they want to access uh, national or, or urban markets or international markets. And so we have been building roads. Um, uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation in particular has a, a, a substantial feeder road building um, program in a number of countries uh, in our Feed the Future effort. Um, so in Ghana, in, in uh, Guatemala, and other places, we built thousands of kilometers of feeder roads to connect small rural communities to the larger market towns or the, the large urban centers. And so this all matters. We need these comprehensive solutions. I'm sensing intense yes. waves of frustration from you. Well, a couple, a couple of points. I think uh, in terms of feeding the world, we, we really need to also focus in on policy making because it's not just, if it were just technology and if it were just infrastructure, since it's a global panel, we can talk about the US, you would not have the kind of hunger rates you have in Fresno and Tulare, uh, one of the you know, uh, major agricultural producing areas of the country. You would not have the kind of hunger we have in this great nation, right? So when we talk about that, I, 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 you know, so far we have not talked about ISTAD a whole assessment that was done in terms of how we're going to feed the world, which kind of came out some very strong recommendations, uh, which was approved and recognized and ratified by majority of the nations, unfortunately not by the United States, uh, which because it said business as usual is not an option. And it's really important to recognize the importance of policy space for each nation to be able to determine what is going to be the best way to ensure that we have policies that end poverty, that provide living wage jobs, so we can tackle hunger uh, right at the, at the base of the problem itself. And lastly, I would say, we all know how to feed this world, like we know how to uh, have meaningful jobs for all. The problem is to figure out how do we prevent those from being in power who prevent that from happening? And I think that's the crux of the major. I, I agree with your I agree with your comments very much, and I we have to realize that one thing we haven't talked about yet is the fact that there's been a huge demographic shift in this world of ours from rural to urban, partly because the farms are not paying, and that's the only way that people can get any kind of meaningful food is to move into the cities because their farms are not producing it in many parts of the world, but. The important thing is, is that when you move into the city, it's the price of food that dominates whether or not you can have enough food to eat. And, and therefore, I return to the commodities market argument that was presented before. That's one of the really important factors. In the last uh, decade or so, the invasion, if you will, of very large amounts of money into the commodities market has flooded it. It's now evident, I think, uh, again, I'll just say that Mary Robinson's uh, connections with uh, Oxfam. Oxfam um, uh, put out a report in, in July, I think, of this last summer, um, demonstrating how critically important that flood of new money into the commodities market uh, uh, presented as a way of, of volatilizing the prices of food throughout the entire world. Food is a global issue because it's food marketing is globalized. And, and the price of corn in, in the United States becomes the same price of corn in other countries because that's the, that's the, it's like water. It's seeking its own level. So we need to build this into the way we talk and the way we plan and the way we think about it because we're a piece of it, if you will, when we talk about agriculture, but it's not the entire picture. We need to begin to think about these other dimensions too. Um, <clears throat> you know, for a long time, ever since I've been an academic, there have been these big debates around the problem of feeding the world is an issue of production versus one of distribution. And it's, it's a pointless argument. I mean, I think everybody in the panel has kind of come to the point that if you, if you can't afford food, it really doesn't matter how much there is. 
So the income distribution comes first, and therefore things like agrarian reform and minimum wage laws and, and the right of labor to organize, all those things are critical and they've been shown to be so. But it's even more complicated than that, and I want to I raise this little issue. Um, it turns out that the relationship between increases in food production at a national level and the increase in income at a national level are only indifferently correlated with reduction of malnutrition measured by stunting and wasting. Right? So countries vary a lot in how much difference it makes to increase food production uh, or to increase income. So India is an interesting case. It has probably the worst elasticity of response of stunting and wasting to income increases and food increases in the world. And within India, the only state, this won't be a surprise to Anuradha, that the only state that actually has a good response is the state of Kerala. What have they done in Kerala? They had, had very early intervention uh, in behalf of, of women and, and female children so that they actually have more females than males uh, as opposed to the rest of India where there are millions of missing women. Land reform happened very early. Very serious public health sector. Lots of, of attention paid to childhood nutrition in the schools and to uh, public hygiene and public health. So it may very well be that those public priorities which reflect a progressive political system, it may be rare, but it certainly is doable at a per capita income that is below India's mean, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think, we, but, but also to recognize this is the Archimedes problem. I mean, Archimedes said, give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the world. Fair enough. Who gives the lever? <laughs> and where is the place you stand? In Kerala, it was decades of mobilization from the bottom on agrarian issues and labor issues, successful mobilization, created a social democracy at the state level. Those are very rare political conditions. Uh, and I think the political economy of concentration of wealth is pointing in the opposite direction, that those political possibilities are not nearly as strong as they might have been before we had these fantastic increases in concentration of wealth, both internationally I, and nationally. I think Jim feels the Well, I, I would just say, you know, we have somebody here from Ireland, a country that was exporting food throughout the Great Famine. So the notion that countries can increase food production um, and, and, you know, still have malnutrition or starvation, China during the Great Leap Forward Famine was exporting food. Um, so. Uh, you know, I think this, this gets to this fact of distribution and, and political power, which I think is at the root of this, that, you know, Don, for me, the reason people are hungry in other countries is not because they lack advanced agricultural technology. That's but then what, what should we, the world, do about that? Yeah, because a they, lot of what people have been saying today is, can, let's let countries <laughs> use the brains they have and find solutions that make sense for them. Fine. Can I, can I ask a question? Can I, uh, can I talk oh, about yeah. this a little bit? So uh, uh, many people here seem to be interested in technology transfer. And one of the things that we don't do enough of is actually go spend time in developing countries. Uh, and I don't mean as tourists, but spend a month. <laughs> spend a month in a small village in uh, wherever and learn about uh, you know, what is life like there and what are the conditions without ever trying to even think about technology transfer. Just think about what is it like there. And too many uh, government-sponsored programs are aimed at bringing students here. I came to the U.S. actually not from a developing country. I'm from Belgium uh, in 1960. And many of these people who come here stay. So the, the solution is not to bring more students to the University of California, uh, although that, that, is, uh, that is a good thing. Uh, but then to ensure, to have mechanisms that ensure that those students or postdocs or whatever, grad students, uh, go back to their countries by giving them uh, the support that they need in order to get started to work in their own country, and that has to be accompanied by us going there, not just by bringing them here, but us going there for a month or two months. And one of the disconcerting things that I found is that the children of smallholders, they're not interested in being smallholders. 
They want to learn how to use computers and work for banks. Uh, uh, well, I mean, that is actually part of the problem. And <laughs> it's probably not realistic to pretend that won't change, or that, that will change. I think Rebecca feels the need to yes. say Yes, speaking something. of students at the University of California um, working abroad at, to give a plug for the Blum Center for Developing Economies at UC Berkeley, which also operates at UC Davis. It's created an ecosystem for undergraduate students to, to do just that, to work both domestically and internationally. I spent three months in Cochabamba, Bolivia last summer and will be returning this summer for gender equity and water related projects in uh, rural and peri-urban schools. And the Global Poverty Minor at UC Berkeley has allowed students to take coursework that lets them study the causes and structures of poverty and inequality and then have an international experience that is financially supported by the Blum Center and then return and take a course where you reflect critically on your experience. And I think that this sort of movement to have that on the ground experience will breed the next generation of sensitive policy makers. I, I hope I'm you're right. I'm concerned actually because I think it's missed, most of the conversation is missing the point. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anyone in Africa who's really happy to live in poverty. I've never seen anyone say, you know, we're really thrilled living in poverty, suffering malnutrition, chronic hunger, all the diseases that are associated with that. The typical farmer in Africa is on one and a half to two hectares. The land has been farmed for 10,000 years. The soil was this thick when it began. It's not like Davis, California with 65 feet of soil. It's all, it's all bad, you know, they didn't, they didn't choose this soil, they, it's just the birthright that they were ended up with. And when I look at crops that I work on, and I do work on a number of crops uh, from a private held company that's put in the public domain, the yields of cacao were the same 100 years ago till about two years ago, three years ago, when we really started bringing modern genetics to traditional breeding, because you can't do anything that would be this earlier topic we had in these trees. And it's a tree crop, but it has to be improved. We have measured for 40 years the decline of rainfall and the increase of temperature in sub-Saharan Africa. We know it's draconian as a response. And Mary referred to the shocks on the weakest economies in the world. That's what's happening. They're, they're being shocked. But we have to change the productivity model. If we don't get three times to four times the productivity per tree, whether it's uh, physical water use efficiency, nutrient use efficiency, then the game is over. And nobody's going to stay in the rural sector. Why would they stay there and live in poverty? Well, so productivity is going to be one of the first keys. I, now, the other thing, if I could just make one pitch for what Mary said, trees. This is, this is a, a funny word that we don't talk about trees as evergreen agriculture. She mentioned nitrogen fixing trees. The Phyderbia albedia can increase the yields because it's a nitrogen fixing tree three times in Mali, which has already happened in Tanzania for maize. Fruit trees, fodder trees, timber trees, medicinal trees, so you can have your own medicine locally. High value trees where you can sell to the European market, which likes to make fancy furniture. And food and oil trees, because in a terrible drought, you can eat the seed of certain oil seed trees and you're going to get by because you have to live. So, so if we take this down, my final 17 seconds here. We You've take this way down, beyond your final Okay, if we take this down to the depth. basic fundamental um, issues, none of this will happen without a gross change of how we look at financing into the rural sector. Okay, did you want to say something? Yes, um, well on the basis of our work that we've been doing with the farming community, smallholders and pastoralists in Africa, three terms that I would want to put out again, policy space, transparency, and political empowerment, the kind, Ron, you were talking about. Because we've heard about transfer and how do we work with third world countries, developing countries, and how do we provide infrastructure or uh, knowledge. One of the big things that's happening right now is this focus on investment. Let's invest in, in agriculture, an area which developing countries were told not to invest in by uh, the Bretton Woods institutions, for instance, for the longest time. You know, you wanted to make the government small enough to drown it in the bathtub, right? So, and suddenly it is investment in agriculture. 
Now you look at Mozambique, you have set up an agency, CPI, in Tanzania, there's Tanzania Investment Center, in Ethiopia you have a similar center, they all have different names. You go to their website, it's identical word by word. This whole kind of development model, the new paradigm that has been sent by donor countries, by uh, development agencies, as well as by the World Bank Group, is one of now invest in your, let the private investors come in and invest in agriculture in your land and water. The result is in Ethiopia, while we're talking about ending food security, a country which already has 10 to 15 million people dependent on food aid, you have 1.5 million people being forcibly relocated so that big plantations can come in, owned by the Malaysians, the largest investors, unfortunately, my country, India, for cotton. And we can't ignore those. You look at Zambia, which has taken loans from the World Bank to do this whole farm block scheme, giving away a million hectares of land. We are working in Papua New Guinea, where nearly 11 million hectares of land uh, are being given away for logging and special agricultural business leases. So, uh, Mary, you talked about people are moving away from land, not just because of climate change, but the development paradigm, which is coming from outside, which takes uh, not into account the aspirations of the local people, the, the ways of life of the pastoralists, and this top-down model, one size fits all, does not work. People in Africa, Asia, Latin America need to, f no, they know how to feed themselves. Perhaps we need to figure out how do we get out of their way. Do you, I mean, <laughs> that, that seems to be what you're arguing, and it does seem to me that there's some agreement here, and I think in the world, that we have a lot of tools, and those tools are appropriate, and they would probably help, and yet it's up to, it, we also have some road barriers, which seem to be investments, whether they're investment companies, whether they're large farm corporations, whether they're countries or international agreements. What I don't get is how you get out of the way. Like, how you let people do what you think they ought to do. Because one of the things that is happening, it will happen no matter, in India, for instance, people are leaving the land, you know, they talk about suicide farmers, and they talk about it, I won't mention the word, but for the wrong reason. People commit suicide when there's no water and they can't farm, and they are living in slums in Mumbai because it's way better than what they had. And that isn't changing. And as long as that isn't changing, I think some of the rest of this stuff is kind of besides the point. You know, Even though I agree with what you say completely. Oh. Yeah. I, I really don't like this, this international tamasha about farmer suicides in India. I was in, I was in Kenya and the, head of the chair of the agricultural, the parliamentary agricultural committee said, yeah, we've read all the data about this, this agriculture, this and that and the other, but all the farmers in India are committing suicide. The farmer suicide rate nationally in India is low and stable. It's one-fifth that of other categories. The most at-risk person in India for committing suicide is urban, and at the ages of 10 to 14, it's female. I mean, there are lots of people in India in desperate situations, but it is simply not true that there's an epidemic of farmer suicides in India. And yet you will read this on every web page and all kinds of award-winning films. It's just one of these huge hoaxes like Obama not having a birth certificate. Once, <laughs> once it gets established on the web, it becomes reality. And, and I've asked suicide farmers in the most suicide-prone, the quote-unquote most suicide-prone district, I've asked them about this. And they said, A, it's embarrassing you ask us questions like that. And I said, I'm sorry. We live in the West, we see media presentations, the Guardian has something about Indian suicides every other day and so on. I said, it, it's embarrassing, but we, we're asking because we want to know. We actually do want to know what the situation is. And they said, what kinds of people do these urban folks think we are? That we would abandon our families just because we're in debt. And we, we may or may not be in debt, but we've always been in debt because farmers are frequently in debt. So to the extent that, that one can think of Suicide is a response to some kind of generic crisis in Indian agriculture. There, there are certainly desperate inequality in Indian agriculture. There are certainly class inequalities that are extreme. Most people in rural India do not own land, right? Most people are scrambling. There's a lot of labor mobility that's forced. But it is not that farmers look at their crop at the end of the season and commit suicide. But it, I, I think that's beside the point because what their kids do is leave. That's and, right. 
Absolutely. And that's the point. It doesn't, but, I mean, it isn't that it doesn't matter but whether it, their parents commit suicide, but that is not the issue. The issue is young people today have no incentive or desire to do anything but get the hell out. But that's if they don't see a, a prosperous livelihood or a reasonably uh, 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 sound livelihood yeah. in agriculture. And so that, that involves changing uh, the, the agricultural economy in these uh, places. Um, and, and that's something that, it, that, the, that many developing countries have taken on as a national priority. Because one of the great learnings of the past decade or two of, of development assistance work has been the recognition that solutions won't work if they're imposed from the outside. Um, they have to uh, be generated first and foremost by the countries involved. Um, and those are national priorities for agricultural development. And so in Africa, for example, we've seen the, the great success of the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program, where, whereby the leaders of Africa's countries committed to develop national plans with national priorities for their agricultural development. Those priorities have often included a substantial role for private sector development in agriculture. And so a subset of those countries um, worked uh, to, to establish something called the Grow Africa Partnership, where they said, we want to find ways to uh, um, improve the conditions for private sector activity, both domestic and international. And, they, and, and so they did create policy space for private sector activity, committed to policy changes. Um, the G8 uh, uh, reached out, the group of eight, the, some of the uh, largest economies in the world, reached out to work with several of these countries to, to uh, um, commit resources aligned behind their national priorities, mm -hmm. but also to help um, uh, foster uh, connections with private firms that wanted to invest. And these are firms large and small. These are firms, uh, for example, an Israeli irrigation firm that is doing drip irrigation work, uh, another uh, Indian irrigation firm that's similarly doing low-cost, locally adapted solutions for irrigation. Um, it's uh, local companies like uh, a Mozambican farm that's introducing orange flesh sweet potatoes and other highly nutritious crops into the local uh, farming community. So showing that these changes can happen and can be beneficial. Um, and, uh, and it's also large firms uh, from the United States and, and, and elsewhere. Um, but it, it really requires collaboration between, first of all, led by the countries involved, but then collaboration with donor nations, with international research institutions, with international organizations, mm -hmm. um, with universities, and so on. Um, and it also requires recognition of the complexity of the problems that we know, for example, that we need to address nutrition head on if we're going to make progress. Um, we can't just feed, uh, fill bellies. We need to also provide the full set of nutrition. It means looking at the challenges of gender, um, because we know that uh, women farmers uh, generally have in developing countries generally have um, uh, uh, unequal access to the best farming inputs. And so if you equalize that access, you get an outsized benefit. So well, we're learning. I think Cheryl wanted to. Uh... I, I wanted actually to come back to your point, which is that people are leaving the farm. But the idea that that's something new is, right, people have always been leaving the farm. My mother got off the farm in Illinois as fast as she possibly could. And so I grew up 10 miles from here in California. Um, where they so, had no farms. <laughs> where there were no farms, right. <laughs> there, weren't, there weren't very many farms, and it, um, there were some. She was not on one of them. <laughs> right. So that, that phenomenon has been going on, I think, as long as there's been farms. There have been people moving to the city. Part of what we have to think about is not only increasing, thinking about the agriculture piece of it, but thinking about rural economies. If we want to have vibrant farms, um, we also need to have vibrant rural economies. And those two things are not necessarily the same, but they need to go hand in hand. So not only do people, and again, I'm thinking about African farmers, not only do they have to be able to produce a little bit more, but they have to be able to do some of the other value added in their communities so that they're earning more money and other people in their communities can be earning money, and so that the rural communities are places where people want to live, so that it isn't better to go and live in the slums than to stay in the, in the rural communities. Um, could I speak to the productivity, raising productivity to raise incomes? Um, you can quickly, and then I want to talk about the cosmos. Oh, the cosmos. Well, <laughs> far be it for me to prevent the cosmos no, no, um, from evolve unfolding as it should. Um, 
I, th I mean, uh, H Howard, I, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the Mars program, but you obviously have a sophisticated understanding of the, um, of the productivity and income and other needs of, uh, of farmers in those areas. And so it sounds like you're developing sort of diversified systems of you know, income streams, et cetera. But take coffee, for instance. <laughs> The, you know, the large coffee companies five years ago, well actually for the last 20 years, have invested a lot of money in increasing productivity of small coffee growers and large coffee growers around the world. The result was two billion pounds of excess coffee and a crash in the price of coffee. And when that happened, you know, our, the prices we pay for our lattes went down a little bit, but the prices that farmers got were, you know, cut by, by they get a fifth of what they used to. So the notion that better productivity is going to lead to higher incomes is not right. If farmers don't have economic power, mm -hmm. if they right. can't organize themselves to protect themselves in the marketplace, or if the market is dominated by monopolies that essentially set the price for them. So th those are some of the structural things that countries need to be able to deal with, but that also could be dealt with internationally. There's no international structure for looking at antitrust, okay. and I think that's a shame. You've brought up an issue that is going to intervene in my cosmic thoughts. Sorry. No, it's good. Um, how do we make an internet? I mean, there has to be a way to have some framework that makes sense. And I don't see one. I think we're all talking about things that maybe we largely agree about, except they don't get implemented. And people don't get the aid they need. They don't get, people don't get out of the way of the people who need them to get out of the way. And we have a lot of private enterprise, and I'm not anti, but that is an issue that has to be dealt with too. And I don't, I don't see that happening, and I kind of think that has to happen. How do we, who does that? I mean, world bodies, the UN to me is one of the most useless organizations in human history. I mean, but that's not an accident. So, <laughs> can, I, can I try at least a partial response? Yes. So, so, I uh, am an American. Uh, just on, on commodity prices, uh, the G20, the, the larger group, in 20 of the largest country, uh, economies in the world, um, did take a look at this problem and um, came up with something that we hope will help, which is called the Agricultural Market Information System. And it gets at the problem of information. You know, in, in economics, uh, one of the reasons that you see volatility is often asymmetric access to information. Somebody knows something and someone else doesn't, so they try and um, take advantage of that to, for, for, for profit. Um, uh, so the agricultural market information system is, is aimed at uh, uh, making progress in equalizing access to what, what's going on with commodity prices, what's going on with co commodity stocks, food commodities um, of, uh, 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 around the world. And it'll take a while to get fully up and running, but it will help. Um, we also established through the G20 a, uh, a rapid response forum so that there's a, a system for the largest countries in the world, the largest economies in the world, to get together when price volatility strikes. Again, this is something, some of the learning that's gone on since the, the uh, uh, recent price spikes in 2007, 2008 that threw so many tens of millions of people back into poverty and hunger. So we're making, we, we are taking steps. Um, we're, and also it, ha it needs to happen, again, in developing countries um, themselves, and we're seeing changes there as well. So for example, Ethiopia um, ha uh, has established a, 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 a com an Ethiopian commodities exchange so that uh, uh, local sellers, farmers, and, mm -hmm. and, and middlemen can uh, uh, get access to market information in Ethiopia and, and internationally more efficiently on coffee and other commodities, corn and so on. Is can, that what you mean by can, getting out of the way? <laughs> well, I mean, just, uh, I know, Jim, you wanted to kind of address this, but um, one of the things around speculation, especially since the 2007 food price crisis, and it's linked to the financial crisis where actors, pension funds, and others are looking, including mm -hmm. university endowments, are looking at the next soft commodity to invest in, and agriculture is that one that they've been lured towards. The need for regulation becomes very important. There were attempts, Dodd-Frank Act and other attempts that have been made. They haven't been followed through. And it really, again, comes back to the issue of food democracy and knowledge and transparency that we as citizens can actually be involved in. What bills are there? I mean, the fact that people that know nothing about agriculture are investing, are controlling, indulging in speculative act, uh, activities, uh, if you use the framework of human rights, it should really be a crime against humanity that they can play around and the speculation that happens which will impact the poorest in poor countries, they need to be held accountable. 
And again, because it's a global forum and we talk wait, about people. How would they be held? That's what I mean by the UN is useless. Not that we shouldn't have it, but it should do something. Because it doesn't seem to do anything. Like, how do we hold people accountable? Well, in, in, in terms of just within the countries itself and United States, the kind of deregulation that we have seen on the Wall Street that allowed for the speculative activities around food and agriculture, commodities, it can be a national process. I mean, I don't want to, you know, say at the UN level, I mean, as Jim said, it's not an accident that we, it's become a fig leaf. So it's very deliberate the way what has happened with it. But one thing I did want to come back to, we have talked about people in developing countries, young people not wanting to stay on land. Mm -hmm. US is the canary of, of this industrial agricultural model that has been sent around the world. Look at the average age of farmer in the United States. 58 years and older. Uh, if, uh, and if you look at uh, the, the, and you talked about rural economies, the poorest 50 counties in the United States, 48 of them are rural counties. So what happened with the policy making that instead of just focusing on technology and how we increase food production, we forgot about communities and farming families and communities, and our policies had to be centered around them instead of outside like we have. And to make the change, we need social movements. That's the political process. That's the process that lights the match under the, under the political process. It's the social movements. It's the social movements that the average spring, for example, um, can be really closely traced to the price of food and the increase in price of food. So oh, we need all social movements. I brought with me a social movement that we're starting at my university, just as a quick little thing. Every, every university has a t-shirt. Well, this one is on food waste. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you can okay, see it. Okay, we'll but, allow you to have an advertisement. <coughs> but yes, yes, I'm not trying to advertise that because I'm really very peripherally involved other than getting the t-shirt, but it, and it was in my suitcase. And, <laughs> and my point, though, is, is that the t-shirt's made in Haiti, by the way. <laughs> we'll continue. I have one. <laughs> The, these social movements make a difference, and if we can get they, and they then create the climate for the kinds of things that you want to see enacted, so, and the kinds of things that ultimately get enacted by the G20 and all the other well, things. Well, maybe that I'm about. overly um, optimistic. You know, as I said, I have a place in the Hudson Valley, and the, I see lots of social movement. I see lots of young farmers now. You know, it doesn't move the dial yet, but there are a lot of young people trying to make it in the farming world, and they have what I would consider to be really good intentions about communities, and it's very hard for them. It's very hard in this country, in a prosperous part of this country, for them to make a go of it. So that makes me wonder, in the developing world, again, this question of what should R, by R I mean rich folks, and I think we maybe should also talk about China when we say us, because they're going to be running the world soon, and we should discuss that. Um, no, but in all honesty, I think if you go around certain parts of Africa, every school, every hospital, every motorcycle, it's Chinese. And that is either a good or a bad thing, depending upon your perspective. I'm not sure it's an entirely bad thing. Shouldn't we also recognize that there's winners and losers in agriculture, the early adapters, to modernizing their crop, getting fertilizer, uh, tend to win in the rural sector almost everywhere, and th it's just an inevitability. I mean, I don't, I don't know how we can sort of expect that we want the rural sector of Africa to stay rural when, as you said earlier, their children want computers and to work in banks. I mean, I don't know that we can put a moral judgment on the fact that they don't want to do that. However. Africa imported $60 billion worth of food last year. So what would happen if the African Union decided we're gonna take $1 billion of that, lay it on to research to improve the crops, monitor it very carefully, however you want to, and forget about necessarily US aid or Chinese aid or anything else, but actually work on the problems they have. I thought I was. <laughs> I, I was facing the wrong way. I was just simply saying that if $60 billion of actual food imports came into Africa last year, what would it take for us as a global entity to say, why don't we spend $1 billion, which would equal the World Bank money for Africa this year, next year it's a, million, a billion four, and actually try to solve the problems locally? 
and bring in the people? Or do we turn to the richest countries in the world and say it's going to take a billion dollars to save $60 billion, but it's going to take 15 years to do it, and who's going to put the money on the table to get this done? Is it going to be the private sector? And do you all trust the private sector? It doesn't seem like it in most of the conversation today. Or do you trust the public sector? And most of you don't trust the public sector either. <laughs> that leaves us very few sectors. Just, just yeah. to uh, put the billion dollars in perspective, um, in, in 2009, so shortly after the price spikes of, of 2007, 2008, throwing tens of millions of people into poverty, um, the, the leaders of, of the major countries of the world, it was the G8 plus many others, there's about two dozen national leaders and another dozen or so leaders of regional and international organizations and, and uh, research institutions and so on, got together and, and launched the, the uh, L'Aquila Food Security Initiative, named after the city in Italy, L'Aquila, where it was launched. Um, and, and 13 of the donor nations involved uh, committed uh, a total of, of more than $22 billion over three years for food security work, development assistance funding for food security. Um, three years later, we were able to report mission accomplished on that commitment of funds. We actually did budget for the U.S. more than three and a half billion dollars, which is what we pledged, what President Obama pledged, um, and other countries stepped forward too. So there is money being put against the problem. It's not enough, but it is there. I've been <clears throat> encouraged to let you people have a five-minute break. I wouldn't have done it, but <laughs> people ahead of me. So if, and I think you got, if you want to stretch for a couple minutes, if you all go to the bathroom now, it will be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> so you be judicious. Um, and so maybe really panelists just a couple, first for the bathroom. Panelists minutes. first. <laughs> yes, panelists first. That, panelists well, we have priority. a special bathroom that was built. No. Where are yeah. your panelists Anyway, you go fi to five minutes, five. Right. five. Okay, good. What? Oh, oh, oh. 